All right, let's begin. So this video considers a topic called the Q-Test. The Q-Test is reasonably important. I'd rank it probably about three, three and a half out of four stars. And I've um, chosen to go with a, a possible encounter on an exam here. Um, the Q-Test is actually, it does the same thing as the Grubbs test, just in a little bit different way. Uh, the Q-Test is a little bit historically older. Um, so I kind of downgraded this from the Grubbs test just a little bit um, from likely to, to possible encounter. It's, it's probably more probable that you'd see a Grubbs test problem rather than a Q-test. However, the Q-test does a very, very similar thing for us. And its purpose in life is to detect the presence of outlying data points in our data set. Okay, so it's going to be another quantitative test to determine whether a strange data point is an outlier. And of course what that means is if you do an experiment uh, multiple replicate times as you normally do in a chemical analysis, maybe you analyze the, five, the same sample five times or, or eight times, and one of your data points is just really, really strange. It, it seems like it doesn't belong in the data pool. It seems just fundamentally different from the other data. It makes sense to try to test to see whether or not that is an outlier. And of course, an outlier is basically a point that doesn't belong to the, the distribution of data. It belongs to a different distribution. So maybe something went wrong in your experiment. There was some gross error. The experiment didn't work. You add the wrong amount of reagent A, B, whatever. And that data point just ended up being wrong. Well, you don't want to include that in your data pool. You'd like a mechanism by which you can justify throwing it out. And the Q-test basically does that for us. It justifies throwing out certain data points that just seem incorrect, okay? Now how does this work? We are going to compute something called Qcalc. Here's the formula for Qcalc. And then we're going to compare Qcalc with a tabular value. If Qcalc is bigger than the tabular value, the data point is an outlier and we're able to throw it out. If Qcalc is smaller than the tabular value, the data point's not going to be an outlier. We're not going to throw it out, okay? If we look at the form of the equation here, I haven't written it out in uh, mathematical signal symbols, but instead of what I've done is I've written that Qcalc is equal to gap divided by range. I've used some words here. We'll see what that means in a second. It makes a lot of sense, okay? Um, whenever you're, you're looking at these equations, if you can't remember um, whether or not Qcalc has to be bigger or smaller than Qtable uh, to throw out the data point or to have st statistical significance, it always makes sense to think about the form of the equation um, to justify which one must be true. And as we'll see in a few minutes, the bigger the gap becomes, um, the more uh, far away this outlier lies from the point. So it makes sense that if this becomes a big number, um, you should be more and more uh, likely to justify throwing out the data point. Um, so you can rationalize from that. If Qcalc is bigger, we can throw it out. Okay, so this is the formula. Uh, again, with all these statistical tests on your uh, standardized exams, they don't give you the equations um, at all, basically. Um, so consequently, you need to memorize uh, the equations. And this one's a little bit easy to memorize um, just because of the form. We'll see that here in a second when we consider this sample problem. So an example problem for the Q test would read as follows. An analyst performs five replicated trials and finds the concentration of lead in a lake water sample is 1.89 part per million, 3.41 part per million, 4.17, 2.13, and 6.63 parts per million. It's important to realize that these five data points is from exactly the same water sample. The analyst just performed five tests on the same exact water sample, just got different results, okay? So as we scan this data, we suspect perhaps 6.63 parts per million is our outlier. We want to use the Q-test to determine if that's the case, okay? So let's perform a quick sample problem so we understand how this works. When you're performing the Q-test for detection of outliers, the first thing that you always want to do is to take all of the data points from the replicate trials, arrange them in order from low to high. So I've done that here. The lowest measurement was this, the highest measurement was this, and they increase as they go from left to right. The reason why that's crucial to your success is because it allows us to determine 
the key variables at play. Remember on that previous slide, I said that Q calc was equal to the gap divided by the range? Pretty simple calculation, but we need to define what these things are, okay? It just so happens that the gap is defined as the numerical difference between the possible outlier and the next nearest point. So the difference between these two values is my gap, and the range is defined in the usual way, so the high minus the low. Okay, so high minus the low, that's my range. So if I wanted to be more quantitative, now I could say my gap is 6.63 minus 4.17. Take the absolute value of that so it's neg never negative. If it was on the other side, it might be a little bit more of an issue. Um, but, but again, this is, the Q is not going to be a negative number. And then I'm going to do my range, 6.63 minus 1.89. I can do my math there pretty quickly by use of a calculator. Of course, calculators are allowed on your exam. And my Q calc works out to be 0.51. Eight, nine, once I do the math, okay? So once I'm armed with that value, I have to decide what to do next. I have completed the quantitative calculation, but I've not yet drawn any conclusion as to whether or not that point at 6.63 is an outlier. This is where we need to consult a data table that looks like the one I've reproduced here on this piece of paper. A lot of statistical tables in this uh, particular portion of the class. Um, again, these statistical tables with the key crucial values of Q will be given to you on an exam. You don't need to ever memorize this. If you're taking a standardized exam, uh, such data is usually reproduced on the inside cover, maybe the front cover or the back cover of your exam, but, it, but it's always going to be there. You just have to kind of look for it. When you do come to one of these tables, you have to understand how to use it. This particular table has a column for the number of observations. This is the number of uh, measurements in our data pool. Be careful to read the subject heading here, okay? Because um, it's entirely possible that this is not number of observations. It might be degrees of freedom. And of course, degrees of freedom of our analysis is the number of points minus one. So you really want to uh, quickly figure out what this column means. Here it's just a number of points, so it's pretty simple. Another thing that you're going to encounter is multiple possibilities for uh, the confidence we have in our um, data point actually being an outlier. So here we'd be 90% sure, 95% sure. We could be 99% sure that our possible point's an outlier. Okay. Now the confidence to use is usually specified in the problem, and I say that, but as I glance back to the sample problem that I gave you. I never, I never ever actually, ever actually um, specify that. So, so let's say that we want to be 90% confident. Now if that's the case, I had one, two, three, four, five points, five replicate trials. So that's five observations. And at 90% confidence, it looks like the key crucial value for Q crit is 0.642. 0.642. So I'm going to go back to my other piece of paper for a second here. Write that down. My tabular value at 90% confidence is 0.642. My calculated value is 0.518. So what do I know? My Q calc is less. than my Q table in this example. This is smaller than the tabular value. And that's significant. Because if I go back, remember in my instructions, I was supposed to compare the magnitude of Q calc with Q table. If the calculated value is smaller, the data point is not an outlier. 
And again, we can justify that by this definition of how to compute Q. Gap divided by range. Remember the gap was this distance between the possible outlier and the next nearest point. And the range was the high minus the low. So the bigger the gap becomes, the bigger this number becomes, the bigger Q calc is. So it makes sense that Q calc needs to be bigger than the tabular value to reject. Here it was not bigger. So what that means is this point at 6.63 not an outlier. And even though it seemed kind of strange when we started off this analysis, the sample problem, we need to include that point in our data pool. We have not justified its rejection by the Q-test. Okay? And of course the reason for that is there's a fair amount of scatter in our data here. Um, so this, this difference between um, 6.63 and this was just not quite big enough to justify its rejection. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Again, the Q-test, reasonably important topic. You might encounter this on a standardized exam. Um, I would probably say it's, it's more likely you might encounter a Grubbs test type problem. Um, however, um, this is a little bit historically older. Um, that's why the Grubbs test is kind of coming into vogue these days. Um, but nonetheless, um, you see this uh, in the literature and you hear people talking about it if you're a professional chemist. Um, that's why I've chosen to include it in this set of videos. Thank you.